Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for your patience holding on. Um, we still have to finish within the hour walking. Uh, we'll see how we go. Just a quick shout out to the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society of Australia National Conference this year in Canberra. Uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, the theme is being human beyond, and the web page is at the top of the slide. Um, so please have a look, and I hope to see you there. Thanks for the opportunity to explore the topic of the role of complex human systems methods in work health and safety. I intend to provide you with an overview of complex adaptive systems and how it relates to our work as work health safety and human factors and ergonomic professionals. Uh, I'll show you some examples of strategies of how to act in complex systems to integrate our methods and tools into our work. I'll go through a bit of theory about complexity and systems, and then we'll look at the methods some examples, and a useful framework in which to position your work. We'll have time for reflection, hopefully, and uh, a few polls, and a collection uh, of, uh, I'll respond to the questions at the end. The talk was originally proposed to AIHS in a face-to-face -face workshop format, and this option is available to your teams if you're interested in contacting me. Uh, just to caveat on the examples I share in the presentation is that they're composites from my experience and that of others. So let's have a quick look at our context, which is the foundation of all work with complex systems, just as it is when you do a risk assessment. So consider the state of the Earth, the scope of human endeavour on Earth, and the impact of those changes in the world on society and economies. When understanding context, you're sensing the disposition of a system. We have a societal context of culture of people in place, our industrial revolutions from one with the first mechanical loom across to four, our cyber physical systems, with the increasing complexity of these phase shifts. We have organisational activities such as corporate business, social enterprises, community development organisations and the functions they serve and the teams who work in them. And consider the individual diversity within a community or organisation. For our practice, our contexts include risk, safety, health, well-being, change to manage transitions and power. And our paradigms for health, human factors and ergonomics and work health and safety as we know them have been around for some time. Safety as a concept was coined in the 14th century. The scientific method and shortly after scientific management uh, was applied to factory design from the late 1800s and shaped how work would be done. Systems theory and socio-technical systems theories were coined in the 1940s and gradually applied to industry uh, from there on into the um, becoming more evident over the 1980s and 90s. The socio-technical systems really led to an understanding of the role of human skill and methods of working, such as teamwork, on productivity initially applied in coal mines. One of the primary motivations for this theory was to underscore the role of choice and organisational design in the interaction between people, the social system, and tools and technology and techniques, the technical system. Social technology. Socio-technical theory has influenced the development of a number of different domains within human factors and ergonomics, and particularly the macroergonomics or whole organisation approach uh, and systems approach to ergonomics. The name ergonomics was officially proposed in 1949 uh, by Professor Hugh Murrell, although there's some evidence that could be traced back to 1857 uh, in uh, Polish, Polish professors' articles. Ergonomics or human factors is a science, scientific discipline concerning, concerned with the understanding of interactions among humans and other elements of the system. The profession applies theory, principles, data and methods to design in order to optimise human well-being and the overall system performance. HFE got traction with design drivers of World War II for better performing aviation and weaponry, for example. 
and then with com more complicated endeavours such as nuclear industry and mining, and later with emergent technology revolutions, the IT and el electronics, and now applied to across all industry sectors. Complexity science has emerged as a progression of cybernetics, computational mathematics, and ecological systems theory. And complex adaptive systems, a subset of that as a school of thought took hold in the mid 80s. The key change here was an interdisciplinary agreement of the concept, which has increasingly emerged from the world of academia to industry practice. It's sometimes known as science of uncertainty. Complex adaptive systems theory provides a radically new way to understand how to create organisations that are resilient and adaptive. Complex theory, complexity theory and complex adaptive systems are an alternative to a more linear and reductionist mode of thinking. From the late 90s, advances in cognitive science and resilience engineering introduced new theories to safety, such as Eric Kolnagel's theory of safety two which gradually got traction over the early 2000s. So we started to realise that fault-based or mechanical views of safety were not working in the context of the more uh, complex worlds of work in the latest industrial revolution. So a focus on what's working well, work is actually done, and human performance better integrates work design, technology, and human behaviour. Stephen Hawking said that this century would be the century of complexity, and Forbes magazine recently emphasised the importance for us to recognise and respond to complexity. So what is complexity? Well, it's a state of having many parts and being difficult to understand or find an answer to. Systems are made of components, connections and modulators, constraints such as safety rules being a form of modulator. A complex adaptive system is a system in which perfect understanding of the individual part does not automatically convey a perfect understanding of the whole system's behaviour. They are complex because the behaviour of the ensemble is not predicted by the behaviour of com the component. The sum is not the whole of the part. They are adaptive in that the individual and collective behaviour mutate and self-organise corresponding to change initiating events or collections of events. The small things can make a really big difference. The study of complex adaptive systems is highly interdisciplinary and blends insights from natural and social sciences. Um, so some examples are the internet and its use by humans, cities, the brain, business and organisations, healthcare and natural ecosystems. Humans are an actor or agent in a complex system and humans naturally have cognitive biases so we need to be aware and work with these and we also have social needs so we can work with those as well. So what are some key characteristics of complex adaptive systems? Well there are many but I'll just give you a few. You can't construct or model it fully, as by nature you don't know all the connections. You also need a lot of computational math to model the complex system um, in any detail. There are small changes that can have major impact with unintended consequences, which may be positive or negative. There's no causality, there's only disposition of the system itself, a state or tendency of it. So the paradigms of root cause are really not applicable here. And there's a constant flow of energy, so think dynamic equilibrium instead of a static state. To work in a, and understand a complex system, you need three things. So you need distributed cognition, that is that knowledge is not confined to an individual, rather it is distributed across objects, individuals and artifacts and tools in the environment. You need to optimise granularity, and which means get as finely detailed as you can. So for example, you might 
gather anecdotes or small uh, lived experience stories from your workers. Or you might go small with pilot studies to and monitor the impact of that on the system. And the third thing that you need is to cut through the middleman or just intermediate. So think of Amazon compared to retail bookstores or methods involving direct consultation with workers to design interventions such as participative ergonomics. So what does complexity feel like? Well, do any of these statements resonate or apply to your situation? Remember, what you see of the system is only a partial scan. So the information we get from management surveys, our own um, collections and observations are only showing you part of the picture. So the work of the future needs a different framework for health and safety. One example of taking a complex system approach is the application in strategic design for work health and safety to complement traditional risk-based strategic planning. So what I did to develop a work health safety strategy was to, I collected anecdotes from workers and decision makers to listen deeply to what stories they could share about the present. Using that data, I analyzed patterns and disposition I uh, got an understanding of the disposition of the system and sort of readiness to change if you like and also identified pocket areas of excellence in practice. So what's working well? From that I was able to create action plans to achieve a more desired, more of the desired experiences such as safety by design decisions in projects or proactive pro-safety actions by people. And we were able to design the action plan to constrain the less desired events such as uh, risks and uh, incident um, predictions. So where a situation is complex, uh, you need to design your strategy to allow for emergence through carefully crafted safe to fail ex experiments, trials or pilots, and carefully worded strategic planning documents during business funding cycles to allow for local adaptation and decisions locally um, in a devolved state about how work is actually done. This approach also provides a foundation to measure the impact through lead measures and sets up, you can set up data systems to monitor those changes. So the questions you're asking are, are we having more of the desired experiences and less of the ones we don't want? The benefit of this experience this approach in my experience is that it creates a more engaging strategic plan for executives. It can energize teams to implement local initiatives and focus on health and safety outcomes and provides more sensitive lead indicators. It also provides a framework for involving workers to excel at what they do best, their work. What I'm not saying is that all health and safety issues <coughs> excuse me, are complex. <coughs> Excuse me. Or that a complex systems approach is the recipe for all issues, and I'll come back to this point later. So let's turn our thinking from complexity and systems to the methods and tools we use as practitioners. Here you see the human factors and ergonomics, or human centered design model, in its simplest form of the three domains of cognitive, physical, and organisational. And the emphasis is on the interfaces in between those domains. We also have the safety two uh, theory and practices, as I mentioned before, the concepts of nested systems and systems, and human organisational performance or HOP. So the business cases for HSE and work health safety is proven and supported by multitudes of research and industry evidence. So the return on investment can be estimated at least three to one if you're designing in human factors and ergonomics and work health safety initiatives. And this ratio can be a lot higher in more technical industries and as the complexity of the system increases. 
But I ask you to consider how we've been able to bring these models into operation in businesses that are largely, can be largely still structured around the scientific management approach of the 1800s and with a focus on productivity and efficiency of workers and also efficiency of equipment and process. Also consider your role as an advisor, the decision makers in the system, the designers of interventions within the system and the connections of users within the system. So in any, any system, there's not a production part or a human part that can be considered separately. And if you want to ensure that you've got a well-designed system that lets your people perform their best, then you have to consider human factors throughout the design process. It's a common mistake to consider human factors only after critical technical decisions have been made at the end of the design process. It's usually not very effective and the system, when it's put into operation, inevitably underperforms. I'm sure we'd have all have examples of that. So our practice must always be in context of the system when choosing a method or tool. And the reason we create or use methods and tools is to make sense of the world and be able to share those findings with others. In an organizational context, the methods and tools support us to provide evidence or validity for our decisions or recommendations and a historic record. We can also create impact by the application in themselves, for example, through Hawthorne effects. So think about a method's effort, its return, efficacy, and its impact. Be careful to use contextually relevant and valid tools versus the safety dogma or a sales product. Be mindful of understanding of the theoretical basis of the method or tool and be able to share why it's recommended, its strengths and limitations to our clients and managers. Also be aware of our own assumptions of control or preference for order and our tolerances for emergence. For example, we have a tendency to stop exploring solutions too early and we think we've found the answer. And hence we stop exploring how ideas can be improved and made better. This is the phenomenon of premature convergence um, or attribution theory. So when designing in methods and tools into digital systems and workflows, be aware and test their effect on a range of users. Look at their behavior within the organizational context and across different scenarios. In complex adaptive systems, the recommended approach is to bring an assemblage of of methods and tools based on our understanding of the disposition of the system and in line with the direction that you're trying to change. Validation of this approach is supported in research. For example, Professor Paul Salmon, who's one of our keynote speakers at the National Conference for HSESA, looks at multimodal methods for system and accident investigations. There's really the difference between being a chef and working with the ingredients you have compared to following a recipe. You will get something tasty from both, but as a chef, you will take the ingredients to a different level of eating experience. So when choosing human factors methods and tools, here are some of the key questions to ask. And then there's also a raft of practical questions such as, well, how, do, how deep do we go with this? Who's paying for it? What, how much time do we have to understand the issue and options? Who knows how to do this? And how are we going to explain this to management? So I'd just like to take some time to open the first poll. Thanks, Jordan. And look at what's in your professional toolkit. So you should be seeing a poll open looking at what's your go-to tool for health and safety work. So if you'd like to participate in that, give you a few minutes a second. Thank you. Keep responding. OK, 
Okay. And the poll response is very similar to some of the published research I've been reading where task analysis is coming up high, observations also coming up high. Okay. So we might move on from that. We're pretty consistent with published research about using tools in our practices. Thanks for participating in that. So what is a HSE uh, method or tool? Well, there's um, masses of different methods and tools. Um, you know, we're looking at the hundreds. And these are created by research and translated and applied into industry practice. And they vary in validity and they're not universally applicable to all contexts. So I've created a resource to make my work in area and I've opened that as an open access resource for you to use as well by the link um, that you can see hopefully on your screen. So I've categorised these based on research on human factors methods uh, in the domains that are generally agreed by researchers and practitioners. And a whole collection of them, there's four main groups. So there's many uh, descriptive or data collection based um, uh, methods and tools. So task analysis is one of them. That's the most, often the most common method that we use to represent human performance in a particular scenario or task. And from that method, things like job safety analysis or safe work method um, techniques have evolved into industry practice. Uh, obviously, observation, consultation are other ones there. Process charting also, um, which is now very um, common practice in lean and agile paradigms. Um, and think of uh, FRAM as well, Holnagel's uh, FRAM representation. The second set is analytical and predictive. So here you're looking at workload assessment, team assessment, performance measurement, but also interface analysis, um, so looking at usability, user experience and layout design, and evaluation tools such as walkthroughs, so you might cognitively or uh, walk through a scenario, you might use checklists or verbal protocol when you're doing a task, so thinking out loud type activities. Uh, also situational assessment, awareness assessment, um, research by Ensley from 1995, looking at the measures of an operator's knowledge and understanding of the situation under a framework of goals, meaning and projection to a future state. So some are simple to apply and some are more analytical and require some expertise to apply. The third domain group is design, which is uh, at the core of human-centered design approaches. And another group grouping is the systemic. So here you have assemblages of methods for integration, the systems method, and also the macroeconomic method, the so large scale or large organizational systems views. But and one example is the societally applicable tools like the social ecologically ecological model or SEM. Sorry. So I hope you can have a look at that, re uh, that resource. So we can also repurpose some tools for other contexts to which they were designed. And one example of the tools using, being used or applied in a different purpose than originally intended is uh, in a complex domain of healthcare and work health safety management. Um, I provided uh, novelty and an ability to quantify the experience of users by using the system usability scale, the SUS, or quick and dirty as it's also known. And um, this was originally designed for IT interface analysis, but there's research evidence that you can apply it in a field context um, through interviews. So I interviewed health and safety representatives and work health safety staff to make a study of how they experienced the digitally based work health safety management system. And from this data, I was able to determine patterns of acceptance and user issues for the digital presentation of the content within the Work Health Safety Management System. And I was able to verify that finding with, um, the finding with the teams. So 
So it provided a foundation for us to improve the um, digital presence of the work health safety management system content. But I was also also from using the system usability scale provided quantified success measures to track uh, our improvement. Now generally we want to use the right tools for the type of system and um, we only have a partial scan of the system's disposition through traditional work health safety measures and management surveys for example. And, uh, we need to be aware that some of those things can be gained or only represent a biased view. We also want to get as close to the source of truth as we can to understand context and risks and how at work is actually done. But research is showing that we have a bias as practitioner in what tools we reach for and they may be a limited range and there may be constraints on what a client is open for us to apply. So often the commonly accessed tools are of low cost, uh, although familiar to the practitioner. And sometimes the methods are cemented into digital workflows or data systems. So these suitable these methods may be suitable in context or they may just be convenient. And of course we'll have our own preferences or bias to which tool we recommend or apply and there may be incentives to recommend tools to a client or manager for example for financial power or status reasons. It can be the case of when you only have a hammer everything looks like a nail to you. Well if you've ever tried to hammer in a screw you know what sort of mess that can make. And while a hammer has its issues, sorry, while a hammer has its uses, we need to think about our professional tools as having bounded applicability. That is, they are best applied to measure or intervene when we know the disposition of a system and its tendencies, as well as the strength and validity of the tool in that context. So how do we understand the disposition of a system? Now I'd like to take you through a framework for complex adaptive systems that may be useful to your work. So if you think about the world in which you work, there are some things that are obvious, like selecting from these blue pencils if you want to draw a picture. They're all similar and ready to use. In a workplace example, say a door needs to be locked. So you need a key and you need someone to hold the key securely. Sometimes situations are more complicated and you might need a blue pencil for a specific purpose like the watercolour pencil third from the right. But you still essentially need to use a blue pencil. In a more complicated workplace example of our locked door, someone holding the key is an electrician and the key unlocks the main switchboard to a plant. These examples represent the world of order. So an ordered side of the world. On the other side of the world is the unordered side. Things may be more complex and you may not be able to see all the options and elements and connections in the system. Here we find the blue watercolour pencil but we can't see if it's sharp and ready for use. And we also find the pencil's historic predecessors such as the lead pencil and the feather and their emergent relatives, the pen, with novelty adaptations of Nemo. In a workplace example, a worker remote from the plant site may be interacting on a control panel with lockout switches. The operator is able to lock the door on the site remotely. The plant is being locked down for the electricians at the site to do their maintenance run. And sometimes on this unordered side of the world, the system becomes chaotic. And here we find a blue pencil that's no longer usable, it's broken. There are random agents or actors within the system that may not be immediately recognisable. And generally we can't get our drawing done without acting to sharpen the pencil. Can you see the sharpener? Once the pencil can be sharpened, we move the system into a more stable state. In our workplace example, for an operator relieving at the an operator is relieving for a shift, 
at the control panel. The indicator switch to unlock the door on the remote control panel looks similar to them to one that locks, locks the door at another site's control room. So this operator is confused. And so this time the operator unlocks the door which is meant to be locked at the, at the plant site. At the plant site this leads to the site worker gaining access through the unlocked door who then closes the electrical circuit during the time when the electricians elsewhere on site are doing their maintenance task leading to an electric electrocution event. So I've just tried to give you a representation of a simplified version of a framework of complex adaptive systems called the Kinevin framework, C-Y-N-E-S-I-N. And I'd like to now explore this framework related to our practices and choice of methods in complex systems. So the Kinevin framework, as you see here in full now, is not a matrix nor a model that visually represents the domains of systems in which they, which they can exist and guides you to understand and design interventions contextually specific to the disposition of the system. I've found it quite a useful framework to guide my professional practice over the last decade and applied it to, for example, strategy design, program and intervention design as well as change management and also found it useful supporting teams to understand and improve stakeholder engagement. So it's quite a flexible framework. This framework is being applied globally to complex adaptive systems such as defence strategy, justice systems, urban design, organisational design, risk and safety and also in community health programs. The key thing about this framework is, is coupled with sense making or narrative analysis methods uh, to get that granularity that I talked to about as being needed for complex, to understand complex adaptive systems. So let's have a look at your um, experience as practitioners and the methods and tools you've used. So I just ask that the second poll be opened and I invite you to think about a time where you've acted as a practitioner and the methods or tools that you, you've used. And using this Kinevin framework, I want you to think about um, in which domain you were operating in. So the poll should be open for you. If you'd like to participate, I invite you to do that now. So the ordered domains are obvious and complicated on the right hand side and the unordered domains are complex and chaotic in the simplified version. Okay, and it's not surprising that we're working a lot on the unordered side as health and safety practitioners and HSE practitioners. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you for the responses there. So the highest is sort of working in a complex domain, uh, next highest is complicated and of course chaotic is the high representation as well. So now we're going to open the um, poll, second poll, the last poll, uh, which is now to have a think about um, using this domain, uh, this Kinevin framework, on which side are you most comfortable working in? the ordered or unordered side. So opening the, seg the third poll, which is the last poll we'll do. If you want to participate in that, please do so now. Which side are you most comfortable working in, the ordered or unordered side of the Kinevin framework? Yeah, so we quite often experience uh, cognitive dissonance, if you like. Um, our preference is to strongly to work in the ordered side and yet our experience is telling us we're working on the unordered side quite a lot. So thanks for having fun with that. 
So making sense of the disposition of the system and the domain in which we're operating in is important so that we know how to act and what methods we would choose. Um, as I said, on working on the complex domain, the recommendation is to bring an assemblage of methods and tools. And we certainly don't want to make assumptions about the nature of the system and bring our own um, cognitive biases to the fore. So, Sorry. So Eric Holtnagel argues that safety is the state of the whole system. You might hear it uh, often quoted as an emerg system's emergent property. So there's still some discussion going on about this. So operating in complex systems and as a professional in our practice, what do we do? Well, there's two rules of thumb that, that I'd like to give you. Um, that you'll hear across um, several different um, theories and frameworks. So look for what's working well, amplify it, replicate it and scale it. Look for what's not working well and what you can learn from it and how to dampen or constrain it. And our safety rules and procedures are a form of constraint. We need to be conscious, as I said, of the context and domain in which we're operating in when we're selecting a tool. For example, when operating in a complex domain, it's not about command and control to impose order. Remember, there's no, no causality in a complex system. We're operating on the unordered side, and we don't know who might unlock that door and what the consequence might be. As a macro method, work health safety management systems, which are premised on models of quality improvement, may not be the best solution for complex adaptive systems on their own. If you're writing procedures um, and expect them to be applied in practice, remember there's two types of processes, technical and adaptive. In a complex system, you're going to have a preference to use the more adaptive type of um, processes. So you might set a boundary and a direction, a why and a what, and in your stop points, you might then provide a team of humans to contact to work through anything unexpected or complex. And you certainly want to document work is actually done as much as possible. You might also be able to technically link key steps in the process instructions to a recorded narrative, for example, for an instruction or shared heuristics from experienced workers. For management, best practice industry methods is most often desired by management because it meets a need. But for a system operating in a complex domain, what you want to apply is assemblage of methods and tools uh, particularly specific to that organisation and also be able to inspire um, emergent solutions from the groups working within those organisations. For strategy or intervention design, you want to set a direction or desired path rather than hard goals and targets. You want to stimulate patterns of activity, for example, with safe to fail designed experiments that you're probing into the system. You want to provide mechanisms to allow for scanning the context as much as you can, so encouraging that sensing culture. And this creates a form of lead indicator to understand the shifts in the system and also warning signs where you might be drifting into failure. You want to use tools such as pulse surveys, collecting lived experience from workers, and at a basic level, your daily toolbox talks can act as a low-tech method in this way. You want to adjust your activities and interventions in response. So as I said, what's working well, you want to amplify, replicate, and scale. And what's not working well, you want to learn from and dampen or constrain. And that's your response mode. On the way, you're continually evaluating through sense-making methods like consultation, observations, collecting lived experiences, and analyzing patterns and shifts in your data and information. So, the choice of tools comes from your expertise, but also recognise that solutions are within the teams you're working with, and you, 
keep some space for those emergent solutions to occur and also that experimentation um, to be uh, embedded within the culture of the teams and organisations you're working in. The most effective methods will suit the context and disposition of the system you're operating in. And that, in a complex domain, means a bespoke assemblage of methods and tools rather than an off-the-shelf or best practice proprietary package. If you consider a system to be in an ordered domain, such as obvious, then you would apply different strategies, which we don't have time to go into today. But I want you to be aware of the assumed of obvious. And here's an example of why. The context was in a technical maintenance work group and what we, the activity was transitioning from a paper-based safety procedure system into a digital workflow knowledge-based database. So we were aiming to integrate content within the procedures into a knowledge database. When interviewing a technical manager about a procedure that they'd written, I asked how much of the 83-page procedure they actually used. Well, it took three conversations for them to trust me and admit that only one attachment was actually used and up new started in the professional um, group. The rest of the content was just there because they thought it should be, either to cover themselves legally or not to offend some of the previous authors or to retain, retain historic knowledge. And so we had to work through and unpack the assumptions about what was actually needed to convey work instructions in the procedure and um, what could be linked or referenced in other parts of the knowledge database, such as legal obligations and the context with historical context, content with historical context, or what technical information that only a few needed to read. So I've given quite a few examples of my experience through the talk, but I'll just share one final one as an example of integrating human factors and ergonomic methods in a complex domain. So the context was uh, looking at safe work method statements and the process analysis in a medium-sized organisation, which is quite a technical net engineering organisation, which had project and normal operations, high-risk work. So they used SWIMS for risk management and legal compliance. We knew it was complicated. There was much angst in the use of the paper-based SWIMS form, many pain points in the process, and workarounds were emerging in both project use and normal operations use of the SWIMS process. And as I worked through the many party structured interviews and also the process mapping, applying workload assessment methods, link analysis, interface analysis, the uh, interface of the paper-based form, um, looking at usability of that and the quality of input, and also looking at database systems used by the project management and the interfaces there. So we understood how complex it was and how much time was being wasted, and how much of potential there was for error through inf information duplication and translation between the paper system and the database systems and also the cut and paste workarounds and the final shortcuts that were occurring. There was also high decision load on the key operational manager role um, who were often remote from the construction site. So based on the analysis, I was able to refine the process for the two use scenarios of project and normal operations. And in the end, we uh, estimated that we could save one FTE full-time equivalent effort for the number of swims generated in this company over a year. So quite a significant saving. I was able to recommend reality-based specifications for a transition from the paper-based system into a digital-based system for all and looking at a better workflow to complete the SWIMS. I was able to reduce the decision load on the project drafters and the operations managers. And the company was able to better manage the risk by devolving, devolving decisions to the site operators uh, for the work method changes based on the conditions of the day. And we also built in a feedback in mechanism in the system which would have gap if previously so that knowledge could be retained as to what was actually happening on site to feedback into the data system for the next project, so essentially creating a safe work method statement knowledge database. So, um, just in closing, I hope um, I've given you some 
examples and context for how to understand the context of the issue and complex system, uh, to understand and give you a framework in which to picture which domain you're working in, the Kinevin framework, the ordered side and the unordered side of the world, and an encouragement to be a chef and choose an assemblage of HFE and WHS methods and tools to see the context and disposition of the system. We've also looked at some ways of strategizing um, within a complex system, looking at what we want to work with, amplify or dampen, and um, a sense-making approach to monitoring uh, what, it's po what is possible to change and how you can monitor the impact of whatever interventions you're doing. Uh, and the importance of knowing who, ne who knows what and who needs to know. So I encourage you to work with the people doing the work and the decision makers in the complex systems. Design your interventions to suit the context and disposition of the system. And also be aware of your own bias as a practitioner when you're selecting um, HFE and work health safety methods and tools. Stretch yourself and be aware of what system and domain you're operating and experiment. Much more can be explored about complex systems, frameworks, and the role of HFE methods and tools. I've been happy to contribute to your journey on how to bring this learning into your practice as a work health safety practitioner. If you're interested in exploring this issue further with me, my contact details are there. Um, if you'd like to work on a complex issue, I've got an offer here of a 20-minute discussion with you and your manager about your situation. And if you want to try some of the strategies and um, methods um, I'm very happy to um, work with your organisation to create a rich, richer picture of wellbeing, safety or culture and readiness for change in your organisation and make the most of that lived experience of your workers to understand how to change the situation. And please use the open resource of HFE methods and tools and um, I look forward to your feedback in there. I'm sorry if there's any background noise, I've got a dog in the room with me. So looking at the poll example um, was interesting and looks like we're quite consistent. Um, so I'll just now open the floor to questions. So let's have a look at questions. Okay, so um, the framework I talked about is the Kinevin framework. C Y N E F I N. It's from a group called Cognitive Edge. Um, you can search for them, um, and it's a Welsh word, which is hence the weird spelling or culturally appropriate spelling. And so, it's a framework for complex adaptive system. Thanks, Teresa. Any other questions? We've still got a few minutes on the time. We might just look at the poll results while you're thinking about your questions. So the final breakdown for the first poll, your go-to tool for health and safety work, uh, pretty equal, interestingly enough, with task analysis and observations, which obviously go together. The next most common one was workstation assessments, individual or teams. And then pretty even was the environment assessment and using interviews and surveys, error and incident analysis methods as well. But our tape measure came up uh, as the next most common one, and process charting. Uh, so we're getting graphical representation of processes or systems. Uh, and I guess the more technical ones were less commonly used, as you might expect, um, but there might be ones that you'd like to explore going forward, the predictive methods performance analysis and human reliability, and also knowledge of elicitation, anecdotes, vehicles, focus groups, and narrative collection and analysis. Um, 
in the second poll, yeah, so it stayed steady that we quite often found us, find ourselves working in complex domains and chaotic domains um, in the Kinevin framework, um, labelling of those, and uh, complicated domains, because a lot of us would be working, I assume, in um, IT and, and engineering sectors as well, or industries using IT and electronics. So um, there's another question here, thanks Teresa, from uh, what is a good starting place for a discussion to introduce this approach in a workplace, a sense of ten tension between quick solution and advocating for a deeper approach, the quest for efficiency? It's a good question because you don't want to fold in with um, talking about complex adaptive systems and all the theoretical approaches. Um, often it's um, I'm sure we have much experience that we could share in this group of um, attendees, and that might be a good topic for another com uh, webinar. Yeah. But from my experience, it's really starting um, taking that questioning approach and yeah. trying to work out with management where they're at and what their what their hot issue is that they'd like to address. Uh, by having conversation about that, you can often start to see some patterns. Um, that will give you an indication of uh, particularly applying the framework um, that I showed you. You can start to place their issue uh, in those domains. And if it is a complex system, then you're really starting to look for the granularity of information that they can give you and um, your analysis methods there that we would traditionally apply in work health safety, looking for patterns of injury, but also the, the lead indicators that an organisation might be using can often tell you a story um, in a complex situation far more than what, what's going wrong. One of the easy ways to um, Introduce this into a management group is in a in a sort of a training paradigm or a, a discussion paradigm where you might just say um, ask them for um, some of the stories they live with day to day what what's keeping them awake what they're longing to change those sort of open questions um, and mapping those those things out on a on a whiteboard or on a sticky notes you can then ask them to start to cluster those those, those um, experiences um, using the Kinevin framework um, or just four points of the room, for example, if you've got a large group. And you'll start to see clusters um, of how people are thinking about their issues. Um, and from that you can, you can take different strategies. So people, the cluster, if there's any cluster in obvious things, then you can just sort of, uh, should be a quick brainstorm or under their autonomy in decision making of power to resolve that. If it's in a complicated area, you're going to probably need and want some expertise, but that expertise might be um, refreshing to bring in from another uh, expert domain. So, for example, if you've got a um, on-site uh, coordination issue, um, perhaps bringing in a um, independent party to look at um, just the dynamics on site, um, not necessarily through a workload assessment or a um, site coordination approach, but someone quite who doesn't work with that work group just put a pair of fresh eyes on the on the situation, as well as doing your traditional work health safety site coordination process improvement uh, reviews. If you're working in a complex domain, I've tried to give you examples of how you might introduce experiments so to try different things. Um, and those solutions are often within the team, so you might get that through uh, having a few focus groups on the topic and really putting people in a creative frame of mind um, or an out of work uh, experience so they're in a, in a different frame of mind. Um, and then asking them to come up with fresh ideas on how to approach the topic. Obviously, if you're in a complex, uh, chaotic domain, you need to act first and stabilise the situation. So, in that 
questioning of management and their experience. The chaotic domain example, uh, what you want to then do is look at, look at the attributes of what and why uh, the response happened. And that might give you some more information. So that was a long-winded um, answer, but essentially uh, getting the insights from the people um, is um, always a good, good starting place. So I'll just give you another few minutes to ask any questions. Um, as I said, I'm very happy to talk with you um, separately with you and your manager about your situation. Please contact me on the um, phone and email as shown. And um, I wish you well with working in complexity. Okay, so thank you all for your time. It's been a pleasure to have this opportunity and thank you for your patience at the top of the, um, the webinar. I think Jordan will close the webinar now if there's no other questions. Thank you and um, safe work. Thank you to our speaker for your presentation and thank you to everyone for attending the webinar. You are encouraged to submit feedback by clicking on the yellow icon in the top right corner of your screen. You will also be redirected to the survey shortly. We thank you in advance for your feedback and wish you a great afternoon.